Welcome. Um, first up, we have a presentation uh, regarding the uh, Delaware Aqueduct closure uh, by Jennifer. Uh, oh, yeah, we got an old call. Keep them straight. <laughs> yes. All right, John Hancock. Yeah, he's there. Town of Fremont. Yeah. Town of Delaware. Present. Town of Cachecta. Here. Town of Tustin. Town of Conflict. Town of Highland. Here. Town of Lumberland. You may be late. Town of Deer Park. Here. Damascus Township. Here. Berlin Township. Here. Lackawaxon Township. Here. Chihola Township. Here. Westfall Township. Pata Complex. State of New York. Here. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Present virtually. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Delaware River Basin Commission. Here. National Park Service. Here. We have members of the media, and I will be sure to get everyone that is on Zoom. And I also passed around a sign in sheet. Thank you for everyone for signing that. Right. Thanks, Ashley. So, <laughs> sorry for the mistake. Um, so we have a presentation this evening um, regarding the uh, shutdown of the Delaware Aqueduct uh, by uh, uh, Jennifer Garigliano. Yeah. And um, she's the chief of staff of the uh, New York City uh, DEP and the Bureau of Water Supply. So uh, welcome. Thank you. So I actually got a title change on Monday. <laughs> I am no longer the chief of staff um, for the water supply. I am the director for water resources management. So I'm still in the Bureau of Water Supply, still a direct report, uh, direct report to Deputy Commissioner Paul Rush. Still have the Delaware in my portfolio, so you're not getting rid of me. Um, Was so, it an advancement? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. so, thank you. Um, how do I share this? Just bring it up and... Am I able to share it right from here? We split the difference on the agenda and have both titles for you. Okay. I saw how new that was with your new title. As of Monday. Mm -hmm. Where is, um, can't see very much. <laughs> is it this one? Yes. Um, okay. okay. Okay, so I'm back. <laughs> As I said, I would be, um, and I will be back again. So we are doing a series of presentations showing everyone some updated modeling um, as we are getting closer and closer to the shutdown. So we have a lot of these presentations to do up and down the Delaware, over on the Catskill side, um, in Westchester County, and then doing other work in the city as well. So there's a lot of things. So it's probably going to take us through July to get through the first round, and then we will probably start again um, with round two sometime in August. So Lori, you should probably pencil me in already for either the August or the September meeting, depending on how schedule works out so that I can come back. So some of this is going to be a little bit of a repeat, just a reminder of where we are and where we're going. But I do want to spend some time taking a look at the graphs and, and walking you through the graphs so that you can get a sense because we're going to use the same format when I come back again in August so that this way we get used to them um, a little bit. So again, just quickly, this is the New York City system, primarily surface water, 19 reservoirs, three controlled lakes, 570 billion gallons of storage. We deliver 1.1 billion gallons of water every day, and we support half the population of New York State with clean drinking. So the Delaware Aqueduct, this is the piece that we are going to talk about today. Um, it is 85 miles long. It is the longest tunnel in the world. It runs from Rondout Reservoir all the way down to Hillview Reservoir in Yonkers, and then it enters the distribution system. So it was put into service in 1944, and it's broken up into three different segments. Um, so we have Rondout to West Branch, West Branch to Kensico, and Kensico to Hillview. So for the purposes of the repair, again, we're going to be focusing on that Rondout to West Branch segment. 
So the leaks were discovered back in the early 1990s. Um, there's two major leaks that this repair is going to target. The largest of the two being in Newburgh in the Rolston area. That's where about 95% of the leak is. And then the other part of the project is in Woolworthing. Um, that is a much smaller, much easier to repair um, leak. So again, the reason that this leaking is occurring in Rolston is that when the original aqueduct was put into service, we knew about the limestone in the area. And limestone over time will degrade and it will concrete. So in the aqueduct itself, we put steel interliner in that section where we knew the limestone to be, but we didn't go quite far enough. So in the where the steel interliner hits the concrete, we're okay for the most part, but it's that section where there wasn't steel interliner, it got eroded, and that's where the expression are coming from. So again, here is just a map that shows you where the two different spots are. Um, we're worsening, you can see the hammer with the wrench, um, and then the new bypass tunnel, um, this section here under the Hudson River is what's getting replaced. Excuse me, Jen. Yep. Unfortunately, your slides are not progressing for the people online. I'm oh, no. gonna pause for yep, just sure. a few minutes and try to fix it. Absolutely. Um, can I actually put your flash drive on this laptop? I think that yeah. might help it. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. I apologize. Thought I. Yeah. We just want to make sure everyone is seeing the presentation online. We need to formally name this thing now. <laughs> <laughs> How? Oh, I thought how many weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, try putting on that laptop. I think that hopefully that will fix it. Okay, you never know what this is. Presentation. We actually in August we have the DRBC scheduled to talk about flood risk analysis related to this whole project because um, Amy Shalcross, who is actually there joining us digitally, she'll be the one delivering that presentation. She thought that you know that'll be a compelling issue once the diversions cease to know what impacts that will have on the river system. So she's scheduled for our August 3rd meeting and then we would be happy to have Jen back in September. That'll be a nice seamless way to talk about the whole issue. Yeah, we could. Um, well, we're fixing a technical issue. Um, we'll move on and then return. Uh, we need a motion going to number five. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the April 6, 2023 meeting minutes? Motion by Al. Do I have a second for discussion? Jenny, any discussion? Jim? Discussion? No, no, I'm oh. no. I, I thought okay. I thought you needed. If no discussion, uh, voting all in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. Yes. Abstain. Yes. Motion passed. Sorry. Um, Got to work. With yes. Okay. Right, Zoom right now.
Okay. So just some pictures. I showed these last time of the leak investigation of the AUVs and the RUVs that we put down into the tunnel. Kind of looks like a little bit of a torpedo. It's got a camera on it. So we were able to go in and do um, some investigations to see how bad um, the leaks were. And the solution, no surprise at this point, for the big leak um, down in the Roston area is to put in a new bypass tunnel. So most of this work is already complete. The two yellow shafts are done and the two and a half mile tunnel underneath the Hudson River is also done. So the this project, again, it's the largest and most complex repair project in the history of the water supply. The total program is about a billion dollars. And the goal of the project is to either fix or eliminate the leaks um, in both Roasting and Rewarsen. So this just gives a better look. I did not show this graphic last time. So this gives a little bit better of an idea of what needs to happen in this five to eight month shutdown period. So like I said, this bigger, does this have a pointer? I don't know. <laughs> so that two and a half mile piece is done. What needs to be made are the smaller connections. So the two punch out circles that you see, that's the work that needs to be done. But in order to connect the new tunnel to the old tunnel, the existing tunnel needs to be shut down. It needs to be drained. It needs to be depressurized to be able to do that. We tested that. Um, a few weeks ago, and we were successful in our test in draining a portion of the Delaware aqueduct. So we wanted to see how long it would take us to do it, how long it would take us to put it back into service, you know, what those rates were, because we haven't done that since 1957. <laughs> so we wanted to make sure that we knew what we were walking into come October. So it was successful. We were able to do it without a problem. So again, it's just these two smaller connections that need to be done um, in this October timeframe. So there was a lot of work that actually has gotten us to where we are today. So I know that this project has been more than 20 years in the making, but there were also a series of predecessor projects that had to be completed um, before we could get to the point where we could shut down the Delaware aqueduct. We have put in a lot of conservation measures in the city. Um, so predecessor projects that I talked about. We also, as part of that was a $200 million repair and rehab of the Castle Aqueduct. Um, community customers and water supplies needed to be ready to be able to sustain that five to eight month shutdown. We have a lot of communities um, that tap into our system at a wholesale rate um, that rely on us for water supplies. So they needed to have their backups fully ready to go so that they can also sustain this five day shutdown. So that shutdown, when I came the last time, I explained the tunnel two issues and you know New York City not being um, immune to supply chain issues just like everybody else during COVID. Um, but since then, we've gotten all the parts that we've needed. Everything at this point is finished. That tunnel two connection is done. It's been tested. It is good to go. Um, and then just, I will hit on again, the shutdown management plan that was pulled together for this, um, that went through the full secret process. And I know it's been a while um, since that was done, which is why we have updated our modeling several times since then. This is just a list of the projects that needed to be done. Capital construction takes a very long time. These are also a lot of projects that required different parts of the system to be taken out of service. So they had to be strategically scheduled um, to get them done. So that $1 billion number does not include all the money that was spent here to get these projects done. So the shutdown management plan, I did uh, mention this last time. So chapter 10 is the operations chapter. That chapter in and of itself is 429 pages. There was extensive analysis that was done um, to check everything environmental through the whole secret process, public comment period, you name it, we did it. Um, and 
if you are inclined, that's the link to it, um, and you can go and and take a look. But the entire EIS is is volumes. So I just wanted to hit a little bit on the conservation savings because this is this is a big one. So not even um, with this project, you know, DEP instituted conservation strategies. You know, back in um, the early 90s, I think I mentioned the Seinfeld episode last time where Kramer buys the high pressure shower head on the black market. That episode was done in response to the low flow shower head program that DEP instituted back in the early 90s. Um, but as you can see, the green line is the population of the city and the blue line is the demand. So even though we have more than a million people on the system, the demand has decreased over time. And a lot of that is because of conservation measures and just educational campaigns um, and universal metering so that people are very conscious of how they're using their water um, across the city. So if we shut down the Delaware Aqueduct, which normally supplies the city with 50% of its drinking water, where do we make up the difference? How does the city get its water? So the Catskill system with the recap um, it went through, will be able to supply about 600 billion gallons a day. There are two pumping stations, one at Cross River and one at Croton Falls in the Croton system where we can pump water from the Croton system and put it in the Delaware aqueduct below that Rondout West Branch um, segment. So that will keep water flowing down into Kensico through the Delaware aqueduct that way. Those two pumping stations can yield up to 240 million gallons a day. And then the Croton filtration plant, which is um, in the Bronx and feeds uh, Croton system water into the distribution system can provide up to 290 million gallons per day. So we have a big decision coming up, go, no, go. Last year, this time frame, um, you know, we were looking at the supply chain issues. We were looking at hydrologic conditions. We are looking at all the exact same things this year. Um, so I'm going to walk through just a little bit of, of these in a little bit more detail than I did last time, um, starting with hydrologic conditions. So for us, taking a look at the system east of Hudson and making sure that the Croton system is as full as we can have it and that the Catskill system is as full as we can have it, because as I will show you, some of these reservoirs east of Hudson are going to get down to almost zero um, during this five to eight months period. So making sure that the inflows are good, that we are not in dry conditions, um, that is a very big concern for us. Last year, with as dry as it was, we probably would not have gone forward with the shutdown um, based on how this summer was looking, um, even though we didn't go forward with it. It was more because of the supply chain issues. Um, we didn't have that tunnel to connection to Croton, um, but with the hydrologic conditions, we wouldn't have gone forward in. There are a lot of things that we look at, and I showed you some of this last time when we go in. So we are looking at long-term projections. We are talking with the river forecasting centers. We are talking with the National Weather Service and their offices. We are talking with the Delaware River Basin Commission. We are talking with a lot of our local partners and other agencies in our decision-making process. So I know one of the big questions that has been asked and this um, box um, kind of addresses is that in the event that something goes wrong during the project, whatever it may be, do we have the ability to bring the Delaware aqueduct back into service? And the answer is yes, but how long it takes us to do that depends on where we are in the construction cycle. Um, so different parts of construction require different things. If we are boring a hole into the existing aqueduct, it's gonna take us longer to patch that hole and bring it back into service than if the connection is already made and we're just trying to button things up. So depending on where we are in the construction process, it could take us anywhere from one to, to nine weeks to be able to put the aqueduct back into service. 
So again, key infrastructure is a big one for us. We have finished all of the infrastructure work. We have made all the connections. We have tested it. This one right now is um, a go. So here is a timeline of the project, just to give you a sense of what it is we're looking at and, and where we're going. So even though the actual shutdown isn't until October, the pre-shutdown operations are gonna start in June. And that is lowering the Delaware reservoirs. So drawdown will start right at the beginning of the um, new water year, which for us is June 1st. So it's not that far away. We will start to draw down the water in the Delaware, and that will be through releases, and that will be through diversion. And the goal is to get them down as low as we can get them. We are anticipating about 30%. Normally, if we're riding the conditional system of storage objective, we only get them, we only bring them down to about 15%. So we're looking to bring them down to 30%. So in July, we're expecting our contractors to start mobilizing and get on the site, get their crews in, get the equipment ready, get everything ready to go. So come October 1st, which is a Sunday, we will start turning off the Delaware Aqueduct. We will start that drawdown process that we tested a few weeks ago, and then we will go into construction. We are planning for an eight-month shutdown. Our contractors are estimating that it could take anywhere from five to eight months. Um, but to be conservative, we are planning for eight months. And we are only planning for eight months. If some reason we get delayed, something goes wrong, um, we won't be able to sustain a shutdown longer than that period. So we will bring the existing Delaware Aqueduct back into service at that point. Um, and we will have to do another shutdown the following year. The hope is that everything goes according to plan um, and that we are able to do this in one shot because nobody wants to do a shutdown a second year. Now, after we bring the Delaware Aqueduct back into service, that will happen either at the eight month period if something goes wrong or it will happen as soon as construction is complete. So if we finish construction in five months, we're not going to just sit around and hang out for three months um, and wait to turn the Delaware Aqueduct back on. We will bring it back on as soon as we can, um, knowing all the concerns and making sure that we can balance the system back out. So operations. So like I said, come June 1st, we're going to start to draw down the Delaware. We're going to hit it hard through diversion and release to draw it down as much as we can. How far we can get it down will be based on hydrologic conditions at the time. Catskill and Croton systems, they'll remain uh, full, not 100% full, because even if we're running Delaware as hard as we can, we still need to use some water out of those two systems. So it won't be 100%. During the aqueduct shutdown, the Delaware system is going to start to fill up. We will continue to be making releases the entire time the aqueduct is shut down, but the Catskill and the Croton systems are going to drain. I do have slides in here that do show the whole system. I don't think I'm going to have time to be able to run through it, but I will leave the slides so that you can get a sense of what the system is going to look like. And then once the Delaware aqueduct comes back in, we're going to draw off all the additional water, all that storage that builds up in the Delaware system, because we're going to need that for drinking water while the Catskill and the Croton systems recover. Do you have an anticipated discharge rate? That so I'm gonna, we're getting there. <laughs> okay, here we go. So this is the hard part. And I know I said it before, I'm gonna keep saying it. So I don't have a crystal ball. And I have been asked like specific questions. What is the release from the reservoir gonna be on like December 2nd, 2023? <laughs> I can't tell you that. So when we do our long-term planning, we look at a range 
of what the possibilities could be. So this graph is simplified. The graph that I look at is much more complicated. There are um, 63 different traces on that graph, but that makes it difficult to read if you don't look at it every day and you're not sure what you're looking at. So we simplified it here. All of the graphs that you're gonna see for the reservoirs, they all use this um, key. So that yellow line is the average. So under normal operation. So over the last 63 years, that's what the average storage in a particular reservoir has looked like, that yellow line. The first light blue line that you see on that graph is a simulated shutdown. That's what the storage in the reservoir is gonna look like on a wetter than average year. So if the conditions are wet, that darker blue line in the center there is the model simulated average. So if we have normal conditions, what we consider normal conditions, average conditions, that's what the model simulation shows. That light blue line on the bottom there is a model simulation based on a drier year. So if it's dry in the system. So think of it as like the 25th percentile, the 50th percentile, and the 75th percentile. So we, we showed those ranges just to make it a little bit easier to read. That yellow shaded part that you see in the background there, is the min and the max that's happened over the last 16 years. So that's something that we've seen under any conditions, any under all operational scenarios. So I'm gonna walk you through the Delaware system. Did you change that or did yeah. I change that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're I'm gonna focus on Cannonsville, Kropakin, and Never Safe. So again, based on the modeling, which we update regularly because hydrologic conditions are always changing, we're anticipating to be able to draw the reservoirs down by 30% or more ahead of the shutdown. Now the decisions for the releases and what we're diverting, you know, those decisions need to be made in real time based on the best information that we have. And our operators are doing that. They're very skilled in what they're doing. They're coordinated with the other agencies and what they're doing, and they will be making, you know, the calls and the decisions when the time comes. But again, that's why we're looking at a range in long-term planning as to what could potentially happen. Okay, so I'm going to start in the top right corner and take a look at Kapakin. Again, that yellow line is what the 63 year average is and what we have seen um, happen. That dark blue line that's pretty close to that yellow line is what we're anticipating for the model shutdown. So it looks like by October 1st, which is that dotted line going vertically, um, Papakin comes down anywhere between, I can't really tell, but I think it's like 65 to 70%, somewhere in there. Never sink. Never sink, I'm not going to lie, is going to be a tough one for us. Um, it has the smallest release works out of all the reservoirs. Um, if it's a wet year, we could spill according, you know, to our simulations, you know, the beginning of March, which you know, we did this year, um, so it's not unheard of for us to do that. We've, we've seen that before. Never think we're going to get down um, based on hydrologic conditions and the current simulations to almost 60% full. But again, that yellow line is the, the average over a 63 year period. I'm gonna start this time with Cannonsville. So Cannonsville has the highest release works in the system 
um, we're able to make the biggest and largest discharge out of there. Cannonsville, based on the simulations, we're hoping, you know, in in normal year, we'll be able to get it down to about 16%. Runout Reservoir, Runout is our terminal reservoir. So Cannonsville, Compassion, and Never Sink um, through their individual tunnel outlets feed Runout. And Runout is the start of the Delaware Aqueduct. So when we shut down the Delaware Aqueduct, we shut down the diversion. So those individual reservoirs will not be feeding Runout. Runout does have its own watershed and it does have its own yield, but it's a lot less than the other three reservoirs. Rondout is also unique that in its um, released works and the start of the Delaware Aqueduct are in the same building. It's in the same facility. That's the Rondout Affluent Chamber. So we have to shut down the entire chamber. So when we shut down the Rondout Affluent Chamber, there's no way to discharge water out of Rondout, whereas Cannonsville, Compassion, and Never Sink still have their release works fully functioning. So we did put three siphons on Rondout Reservoir so that we would be able to still maintain the conservation release coming out of that reservoir. And if it is in a wetter year, we would still have a way of evacuating water out of that reservoir, which this one is the only one that we would not have. Now, siphons were evaluated at Cannesville, Capacitin, and Never Sing as part of that EIS process. And what the modeling showed is that the release works at those three reservoirs were still sufficient in being able to maintain the reservoir levels. So it was determined at that time when the EIS was done that siphons were not needed at Cannesville, Capacitin, and Never Sing just for me. So the Catskill system, how much time is it? I want to be able to take questions. So I don't, do you want me to go through these slides? Do you want me to field questions? Do you I, care about I think the, system? it's it's an important topic. So yeah, if you could run through them okay. quickly. So we will be, go quickly. Yeah. Okay, so Scoharie and Ashokan. Next slide, please. So Ashokan Reservoir is, um, split into two basins, east and west. Um, so we can draw from one basin or the other. So that's why they're modeled separately here. So a show can, um, we are able to maintain fairly decently. Um, next slide, please. Because Schoharie Reservoir feeds a show can. So um, Schoharie is going to come down pretty low. Um, to be able to keep the levels pretty high up in the show can, since that's where the bulk of New York City's water supply is going to come from during the five to eight month shutdown period. Next slide. So the Cronin system is very confusing. So unlike the reservoirs in the Catskill and the Delaware system, um, there are a lot of very small connected reservoirs um, in the Croton system. So we're going to go through this in um, a little bit of subsystems for the Croton system. Next slide, please. Starting with West Branch. So West Branch is technically, West Branch and Boyd's uh, Warner's Reservoirs are technically part of the Catdale system for us. So they are part of our filtration avoidance because um, the Delaware Aqueduct can feed West Branch Reservoir. These two reservoirs, next slide please, are going to be held as reserve. So these um, two reservoirs are going to be held in reserve, and if we need to, we can take the water from West Branch Reservoir and put it into the Delaware Aqueduct at West Branch and feed it down into Kensico. So the idea is if it gets dry um, or if we lose a pump station or something else goes wrong where we're finding ourselves unable to meet demand, um, we are gonna go ahead and use water out of these reservoirs. Simulation wise, the pump stations are on during this. So that's why you see these two reservoirs um, still high because they are being held in the 
Okay. Croton falls from the system. Next slide. So Croton falls and Croton falls diverting reservoir. Um, these two reservoirs, um, they are going to come down to about 80% um, by the model simulation. They are fed um, by some of the other smaller reservoirs in the area. So East Branch is the big feeder. So you can see it comes down to almost 20% because it is feeding um, some of the other reservoirs in the system. Middle Branch um, will come down to about 80%, but we can hold that one. East Branch is going to help build the branch. Next one. Okay. Cross River Subs. Okay, so Cross River comes down to about 75%. Titicus comes down to almost zero. Um, so Titicus is, um, feeds, you can see the map on the side. So it, it feeds down into, into Muscoo. So this one is probably the reservoir that gets hit the hardest in the potent system, but it does come down to almost zero percent, which I don't even know the last time that has actually happened. I don't think since I've been born. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, so the new Croton subsystem, so the new Croton reservoir feeds the new Croton aqueduct, which travels down to the Croton filtration. Next slide. Hamilock comes down to just below 60%. Musku, you see it held high because it's fed by all the other reservoirs that are down to almost zero um, or 20%. So that one is held pretty steady um, by being fed by some of the other reservoirs. Next slide. So New Croton and Kensico. So these are the last two reservoirs before, um, you know, water really starts to hit the distribution system. So New Croton Aqueduct, water goes down the, uh, from New Croton Reservoir, New Croton Aqueduct into the Croton Filtration Plant. So that one is going to be held pretty steady because the reservoirs in the Croton system are feeding it. Kensico Reservoir is also going to be held steady. So Kensico water leaves Kensico, goes through the Castell UV plant, goes to Hillview Reservoir, which is just a balancing reservoir for us where it gets treated and then it hits the distribution system. So these two are the main ones that are being fed by all the others. So the Catskill system goes into Kensico. So that 600 MGD will be coming into Kensico. And then any water that we pump out of those potent pumping stations that I mentioned will also go to Kensico. And if any water has to come out of West Branch or Boyd's Corners, that will also come down and go into Kensico. Next slide. Okay. So I, I do want to make sure that we have um, some time for questions. So again, this is a very long project. There has been a lot of extensive analysis done. Um, the decisions for what the releases will be will be made in real time based on hydrologic conditions. Um, and it's a bit of there's a bit of an art to it as well. We want to make sure that we're drawing down the reservoirs enough to provide additional flood attenuation when we are not um, diverting water, but we also don't want to artificially throw the system into drought either. Um, so we are we are gonna have it's a big balance. Um, and it's not easy <laughs> to go in there uh, and do these sorts of, of work. Um, so with that said, um, I think we have some time for questions, right? Sure. Questions? Are you yeah. sure they're the only two leaks? Mm -hmm. that, that torpedo looking thing yeah. has gone through. It's gone through all, all the hundreds of miles of stuff? Yes. So there's there's a lot of repair work that has to happen to the New York City system. Um, our capital plan goes out years. Um, you know, a lot of the system, like the Catskill system, is more than 100 years old. Parts of the Delaware system are coming up on 100 years old. Um, it's a mechanical system, so things do need to be fixed. They do need to be repaired. Um, this is a big repair that needs to be done. 
but those are the two leaks that we that we found. So reversing is just going to be grouted. That's all that needs to be done in the reversing. Um, and then the bypass tunnel is going to happen in that other section. Um, when, when you uh, indicated drawdowns, the reservoirs, is, is it like 30% from the mean capacity at the time, or is it 30% off the, the maximum storage capacity? So think of it as, so when we say draw it down by 30% of the storage, the reservoir will be 70% full. So bringing, it, bringing so it down. It's based on its maximum capacity storage. Yeah. I just have a, I'm just curious. You you looked at all this other, and you said there's steel linings in it in places. How are they holding up after all these years with this, water? The steel interliner is fine for okay. all these. Just curious oh. after all that years of water. There there will be new steel interliner okay. um, put in to the new bypass. Okay. Further out this time though, um, <laughs> so that we we don't okay. have this problem again. But the fuel interliner did hold up. It's where we didn't have it mm -hmm. is where the problem came. Doug, yeah, are, uh, so when these drawdowns start, like say in July and stuff, are people going to be able to use the river yet? Yes. Or how high is it going to be? So it's not going to be higher than. Like, you know, back uh, a couple of years ago, they did that test drilling for hydroelectric and they had to draw down the. Yes. The cannons bill. Mm -hmm. They dropped it down like halfway or something. Yes. Before they figured out it was okay. Um, like that river was high all summer. Yes. Is it going to be like that? It, it'll be higher than normal. So the releases will still be made based off of the flexible flow management program. And the most water that we could release, because they're mechanical releases, so I'm limited to how much water I can send out of there. So the table 4G release rates um, are the maximum that we can release out of there anyway. Um, but the release again will be determined based on what the storage of the reservoir is on so that. Is drought, into, is drought better than a lot of rain? I don't think either is <laughs> 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 really what we want. Like, we really want that average condition. All the long-term forecasting that we're looking at right now is, is showing us in that average condition, even a little bit drier in some cases. Um, so we're hoping that those forecasts stay true and that we're able to maintain that. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, do you can you guys speak at all about the, the rate of discharge? Like how many cubic feet CFS is going to discharge into the uh that will hit the main part of Delaware? Um, um in like a basic amount. Right. So the, the maximum releases. Mm -hmm. So because the way that we do our calculation for what the release is going to be, so we're looking into the future when we do that. So we're looking at how much water is available for the system and how much of that is not needed for diversion. So since we know we're not going to be needing diversion, it's going to keep us in a higher FFMC table than we normally would be during the summer months. During the summer months, you can typically see us drop table 4G to the highest. They go from A to G. Um, we can drop anywhere down from G to like E, sometimes even even lower in the summer. I imagine that the releases during the summer, because we're not going to be diverting water, are probably going to stay close to that 4G release rate. Um, and they also vary seasonally as well. So it's hard to say exactly what it's going to be um, because again, these decisions need to be made in real time. There's a lot that goes into what the actual release is going to be, but we are going to follow the release table in FFMC. So, what's the maximum CFS release that you can put out at any given time? Of the and so, coming so up in everything they can. With this so, Cannonsville is a 1500. CFS release, that's the maximum that can come out of there. Papatin, 750 CFS. 
think I have that right. And then never sink is 190 CFS. That's the maximum. That and then once it starts in June, that's going to be every day that you're releasing, right? There's not, it's not like it's just going to be on the weekends. It's going to be constant release until that's drawn down to what we need to get right? Well, we release constantly anyway. Okay. Um, but the release will probably be higher than it normally would be. So we don't like to toggle the releases. It's not good for the infrastructure. So we like to hold them as long as we can. But we run our modeling every day. We make decisions every day. We don't want to be changing it every day. We want to be able to hold it steady. Um, but we would drop the release if conditions turn dry and because we don't want to artificially build the system into drop the system as much of an art as it does science. And it's trying to figure out what that balance is to be able to provide additional blood attenuation, but still ensuring that the system can be built smoothly. I understand because I'm speaking specifically from a delivery standpoint because we are, you know, we can't be an open cockpit boat, it's about six feet of water ferry bill. Mm -hmm. Um, and right now we're, you know, we was at three and a half feet of ferry bill, running about 1900 CSS. So if we're releasing, you know, 1500 from one and 750, we're, we're approaching that. We don't have a lot of buffer room as far as what we can legally operate within, um, for our deliveries and for companies that I have contracted. Business for the summer, and this is kind of our livelihood. Mm -hmm. That amount of water, depending on how much it is, if there's if we have a wet season, we're going to be not in great shape um, for the season. So it's you know on the smaller the things, it's interesting or concerning to see how much is actually going to be released. So I think last year they were talking about doing it in the fall more, um, and then I know for in, for uh, supply chain issues, they're able to start doing that. So now it's hitting smack dab when the season starts for. A lot of us liberties that are up here. Um, like I said, if we have rain event, that gives very, very little protection of uh, being operated. Yeah, and, I, and I would that. just send that information. So I got that earlier this week. That is not something that I had actually heard before. Um, so I didn't know the rules, but we have that information now. Um, so that, that's something that we can take into consideration and watch as we're making our decisions. Kind of a, a follow up question then. Um, so, and I'm sorry, there's, there's somebody else back there, but kind of following on that during the livery meeting, there was concern that there would be like a sudden release, like all the, like that you guys would decide you had to get more water out and there wouldn't really be warning. What, what I heard you just say was, well, well, most likely to be, I know you can't predict, right? You don't have a crystal ball, but more than likely you'll be at kind of max releases and then possibly reducing below max so did it like you're not going to be going up and likely releasing more water if anything they'll be releasing a little less did i did i just make that up and what you just said it's hard to predict yeah um but i do think the releases are going to stay higher and steadier but probably better than they would normally over the summer Yeah, right there. Um, I, my major concern is actually after the octave of the slope and the releases that are going to be made pursuant to the FFMP, that's what you said in your presentation. And we all know that the FFMP is based on the um, ability of New York City to draw, divert the water to keep and maintain that water supply. But during this closure, 500 to 600 million gallons a day will not be diverted. And it will build up in our reservoirs. And along with that, um, in the last 10 years, the discharge rates of each of the reservoirs um, have typically exceeded the maximum discharge rates of those reservoirs, the inflows. And so with that, those two things coupled together, I'm concerned that the FFMP releases will not be enough to keep the voids in the reservoirs throughout the closure. And we could end up um, you know, flooding or spilling a lot more often. Sorry, Just sorry. for example, how quickly we can lose some of the um, capacity voids 
And two, just two years ago, in October of 2021, when three inch rainfall um, occurred, never sink went from 87 to 100, the CAC came from 86 to 96, and Cannonsville from 84 to 95 percent in five days. So a 13 percent void was erased in five days, and that was in October. And if you apply that to the chart that you showed us previously, of, let's say for Paxton, that would have taken that 70% that we started at, if we can get down to that, and it would have jumped it to 83%. And in the FFMP at 83%, you only have L1C releases. And that is not going to be enough in the early part of the shutdown if we do not do maximum releases. We are not going to be able to maintain a void in these reservoirs to keep us from spilling. And it won't be by March, it will be by December. So that is my major concern. And I think, I know I would like to hear from the New York CVP and I'm sure everybody else in this room that from day one of the closure, you are going to be proactive and, and you're aggressive enough in the release schedule to maintain those voids in the first at least five months of this closure, you say it probably go to eight months, and then begin to rebuild. Because otherwise, I I really am very concerned about what could actually happen. The what ifs are very concerning. I mean, I pray that it'll be five months. Mother Nature is going to be kind to us. There will be no storm. But we do know that climate change is here and it's here to stay. And I think that you, as New York City AP, you need to prepare for the, the worst case scenario. And so you said you're going to use the FFMP, but I'm hoping you'll just tell us that that will be increased by at least the five to six hundred million gallons that will stay in the reservoirs, or that it will be aggressive enough right from the start. We cannot be reactive in this case because you're not using any of our water. We have to be proactive to make sure the void stays. Yes, and we are being proactive, and that's why the drawdown is starting in June. We will start right. drawing down to the seventy percent. It'll be at seventy or thirty percent void. But then, how do we keep it there? We need to keep it there by doing aggressive release. Yes, and that is what we will be watching. And again, these decisions will be made in real time based on the information that we have. And our team is ready to make those decisions. They are ready to be aggressive if they need to be. We are also worried about the what if scenarios. That's why the graphs that I look at have 63 different traces on them. They're not the ones that we show today. So we are looking at a multitude of different scenarios that could possibly happen. Right, and you're, I know when you did the 63 year scenarios, back 63 years, that must have included the, at the time when the city was diverting the water, correct? Because that's really the only data that but, we have. But we take that data and we run it. The, the simulation without the diversion without the diversion. Okay. So that's what that dark blue line is, is that's the model simulation. And that's why I showed what it could look like if it's dry, what it could like if it's normal, and what it could look like if it's wet. Right. You can see just our concern, yes. you know, about because we know even with diversion, <laughs> reservoirs are spilling right now, and that's with diversion. And so it's scary to think that for eight months, we're not going to have that diversion. Yeah. And, and we have done extensive flood analysis as part of that EIS process. You know, the modeling has been updated several times. You know, when we do our normal daily operations, we are running it every day. It supports the decisions that we have to make for what the releases are um, and where the water comes from throughout the entire system. But there has been extensive analysis done um, for flooding. And I do want to say, you know, I appreciate all the work that has been going on for 20 years and your presentation. But I just wanted to make sure that I reflect this concern to make sure that my office is so awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody on Zoom?
questions? Yes, Tom from Port Jervis. Yeah. Hi, um, could you just clarify on a rainy day situation, which you feel the river at Berryville will be running at? I've heard four, six, I've heard five, six. <laughs> Did you just clarify that on a rainy day situation? No. No. So I. Okay. I unfortunately, that's that's the comment that I made about having that crystal ball. Like that's why I showed a range of what could potentially happen and what we're looking at. Um, I can't give you a specific of what it's going to be on a particular day. Um, I just don't have. Nobody has the ability to be able to do that. On an average on an average sunny day situation, you, you can't give me an estimate? It depends on hydrologic conditions at the okay. time. All right. Um, another question. Are you taking into consideration the releases from Wall and Paw Pack and Eagle Creek into the river at the same time? So the river master does. But you're not, that's not no bearing on what you're going to be doing. It it does because the river master supplies that information to us. To you. Okay. And yeah. just a little bit more. What if now you spoke a little bit of, about the Never Sink Reservoir? What effect yeah. is that going to have on the rest of us down below here, down below um, the, the points in Berryville? Because we have we depend a lot on the what's coming out of the Never Sink also here in Port Jervis to prevent flooding, obviously. Yeah, so so Never Sink, because it has the smallest release works, will probably be re releasing at that higher amount. But again, that's gonna depend on what the hydrologic conditions are at the time. I mean, <laughs> I think that's just the best that I can give you at the moment, which is why we looked and the graphs show a range of what it could look like. Okay, and also what you're saying is obviously in a high water situation, you would be able to, to adjust to prevent any extra amount of water that we would add to flooding in our area? That is something that we watch very carefully and it's something that we take into consideration as we are <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, just uh, one of the few liveries here, but I uh, probably picking back off the last one as well as the other livery question. But I, so the hydraulic prediction side, you know what I had? Yep. So I don't know where they pull all the numbers from to get that, but are you guys feeding them? I know it's not gospel, it's just a prediction, but are you feeding them your information? So if we're using that as an in index, to yes. how we're gonna operate? So we work very closely with them. They have our information. We're getting the USGS gauge data. They're looking at that as well, but they, they are on our speed dial list. <laughs> yeah. So you have one more? Yeah. yeah, just to comment on the question about the um, what it's going to be running at Perryville. Um, I mean, if you're running full release from Cannonville to Pacton, that's around 2200 CFS. Um, and generally with the river, that river all summer long, if you're at max, is going to run generally between 4.2 to 5 feet at Perryville. And that's with zero rain events happening here. Um, like, then that's that was the question before because that, that river jumps super quick. If we got a little bit of rain or if rain comes up from up north, the river is going to jump where. So that that AHIP site is also something that we are watching. And if AHIP starts to predict that the levels are going to come up too high, if they predict that they're going to go into action stage, which is before the flooding, we are required to turn the release off. Yeah, but for the libraries, I mean, that's action stage is 17 feet, I think. My, my I'm not point. sure what so, it is. Mean, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, for us, again, we have about a foot and a half of, of water protection for us to operate as we normally would operate outside of having to be in rafts. And I mean, there's no cutoff for raft teams, but obviously you get about nine, 10 feet, and there's all sorts of debris and everything else in the river. Yeah. Here. So, I have a comment. 
Oh. Um, oh, okay. So, so with respect to the question about uh, the lock wax and that dumps into the Delaware River south of the Berryville gauge. So when you made the comment about talking to the to the uh, river keeper, um, if you guys are running at full bore and the lack of waxen also releases, that's not getting picked up on the Berryville gauge. And that is very dangerous uh, for putting people out on the water. Like I said, this was new information that I just received. Right, so we are going to be taking that back. Okay. Did you have yeah, a question? Um, when you say like you make the decisions, is it like one person? Because I think for like, or is no. it like just a team of it's, people? Or do you have a meeting every day? Like how does we that... do? So we have a meeting every day. So whenever we do any sort of aqueduct shutdown, whether it was the cat seal during the rehab. Or for this one, when we did the um, test for draining down the Delaware Aqueduct shutdown, um, eight o'clock every morning, there is an operations call and you have everybody on this call. And one of the big things that we brief out is, you know, what the releases are, what the status of the reservoirs is, what are the decisions, what, what are we predicting it to be in the next 24 hours? What is the weather? Um, all sorts of information and what is the bailout time. Like those are some of the big things that we talk about, plus where we are in the construction cycle, what is scheduled for that day, the next 24 hours, that sort of thing. So that will happen every day on the weekends at eight o'clock. It's all hands on deck. Okay. I have a couple questions. Sure. <clears throat> One of the graphs that caught my eye was the uh, increase in population in the city with the corresponding decrease in water usage. Does that show up in the wastewater treatment facilities, that type of decline? In, in other words- Yeah, so with less water usage, there's less running through them. That's the assumption, unless people are drinking a lot of bottled water. Well, you do have a lot of bottled water. It is yes. a little bit higher because you do have other things going down the drain besides yeah. water. Um, so, Normally, the wastewater um, they receive more than just what the demand is in the system, but it's not like. But that's been decreasing over time as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, if there's no other questions, we probably ought to wind it up. Uh, I think we could all agree there's more variables in this project than there are constants. Yes. So. Um, Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. And as we get closer, I will come back um, and show you where we are in the process. At that point, when I come back in September, we will have drawn down um, quite a bit, hopefully. And then I will be able to show you the projections for October. Are you using any artificial intelligence? <laughs> <laughs> <Anyway>. So. <laughs>